So I, I hope everybody got a good night's sleep and is uh, ready now for uh, lots of slides with code on it and complicated C++ code. Um, just to sort of get an idea, um, who of you, why is everybody sitting on that side and almost nobody on that side? So I'll, I'll, I'll mostly look at you guys and uh, you, have to, you have to wave when, uh, when you want my attention. Um, so who here has used Osmium in some form or another old or new version or something uh, before? Hmm? Used or f did something with it? Just a very few, okay. Um, who of those who have not used it, um, who is familiar with C++ and can do C++? Okay, yeah, maybe I have to ask the other way around. Who doesn't know anything about C++? Okay, okay, okay. Will be a bit difficult for some of the stuff for, for, for you guys, but um, we'll, we'll see. Um, please, if you have any questions, please ask them. I don't know how we're going to do this with microphones and anything with the, uh, with the video, but um, if you have a question immediately, just show up and, 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 and I'll try to answer, answer them uh, if I can. Um, we've got an hour in this slot. Um, I'll start talking and when I don't want to talk anymore, I'll just stop at some point and then there's also in, enough time for, for more questions. So, um, I assume everybody knows a little bit about Osmium, uh, otherwise you wouldn't be here or have heard the, the name at least. Just a little bit of background. Um, <clears throat> Osmium is at the moment really three things now. There's the libosmium C++ header library. Um, that's how it all started. There's now a, a tool um, called, a command line tool also called Osmium, um, which basically wraps some of those uh, code that is in the library and makes it accessible to the command line. And there's a node Osmium module, a, Node, um, a module for the Node.js um, program to bring, at the moment, some of the stuff from the C++ side to the JavaScript side. Um, this will be extended uh, so that mo at some point, I hope, most of what can be done in C++ can also be done in JavaScript. Um, I've been developing Osmium since October 2010, and for about a year now, I've been working on the new Osmium and uh, I'll talk later, later about uh, changes here and there, but um, um, but it's time to start thinking for you. For, for those of you who have uh, used the old Osmium, it's start to think uh, time to uh, start thinking about using the new one. So one important thing uh, with Osmium is it's all modular. You only get you get lots of pieces that you have to bring together yourself, um, and you only pay for what you use. So all the stuff that you don't include, it's not in your code. There's no library that um, gets pulled in that's huge or something. You only get those, uh, use those pieces that you re really want. And um, the other guiding principle for Osmium was for me always, um, there are too many, there's too much software out there that um, works with little pieces of OSM data, but it's important that everything works with the whole planet. Of course, many people don't want to work with the whole plan, but with smaller parts, so that still has to work. But it's important that everything is as efficient as possible um, um, so that you can work with the whole planet if you want to. Um, the new Osmium has basically all the functionality of the old Osmium now. Um, there might be a few bits and pieces here, here and there, but um, basically it's all there. Um, it needs some more polishing. I need to write more tests or if somebody else wants to help out. Um, and I need to write more documentation. Um, uh, but you always need those things in any open source project. Um, so if you're interested in that, start using the new Osmium now if you can, and so that we can find the bugs and that uh, I get more people to use the code and uh, tell me what's good and what's bad and where the problems are. Um, there's the one uh, exception here, if you can't use C++11 for one reason or another, then you have got a problem because the new Osmium only works with C++11, but C++11 is such a great language, is so much better than the old C++ versions, that uh, if you can do this at all, you please switch. It's much, much nicer. Um, 
So um, let's try an example. Um, this is uh, the Osmium command line tool. Osmium, I, so this is a shell, something you type in the shell command line. You write Osmium, you have a subcommand cut in, in this case. Um, so it's a bit like a Git, for instance, uh, that Osmium ha um, has these subcommands. And cut means basically concatenate all the input files and write them out to the output. Um, in this uh, case, I only have one input file and I have an output file uh, in a different format and it uh, automatically recognizes what the formats are, reads the one and writes the other. That's sort of the simplest thing you can do with Osmium. And we'll later see um, the C++ code uh, that, that does that behind it. So um, Osmium um, has code for reading from files or from standard in. Uh, obviously, you can also read from a URL. Um, uh, you can uh, write to a file, you can write to standard out. It reads the XML format or different, different versions of the OSM or XML format. It reads the PBF format and um, uh, it reads a format called OPL, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, compressed or uncompressed with BZIP or uh, GZIP. Um, you can read normal OSM files, history OSM files, change files, um, and it will detect using the file name uh, what one. Uh, uh, what a file is supposed to be. Of course, you can override it if you, um, if the detection, the auto detection doesn't work for some reason. Um, you can tell them what kind of file it is and uh, it'll, it'll use that. Um, so this is basically the same code. This is basically the code that is behind this command line um, uh, in C++. There's not much you have to do. You initialize the reader. Um, give it the file name that um, you want to read. Um, you, uh, in this case, uh, also you, the, the header is initialized and read from, uh, from, the, from the input file. Uh, we change the generator uh, that will then show up in, uh, in the XML. If, if you've ever seen an OSM file, you've seen that to my converter program in this case. We initialize a writer. Uh, give it a f the, with a file name and the header that we have just um, uh, defined. And then there's a loop reading uh, buffers with data from the input side and write them out to the output side. That's basically exactly what is in this Osmium CAD program. It's just this with a little bit of program uh, command line parsing and all that, uh, command options uh, parsing um, uh, before that. Um, I've in this um, in the code. Can can I? No, doesn't work with the laser pointer. Uh, oh, I've got a mouse pointer. Yeah. Okay. So um, in Osmium, all the um, all the classes in Osmium are in some kind of namespace. So all the input output classes are in Osmium I/O namespace, and um, in in uh, this and then all later. Um, slides. I have left out those namespaces to make it uh, easier to read on the on the slides. Uh, but normally you would write here Osmium or, or Reader and Osmium I/O header and, and these kind of things. Um, so this is a, a simple uh, simple converter. And of course you can do lots of other things. You can set other options in the header, um, or you can work with the data in between. And we will get some of those things. What is very important? A very important concept in in Osmium is this buffer that you can see here. So um, what happens is that the, um, the reader reads a certain amount of data from the input and puts this, puts this in a buffer. So it reads, in normal file there would be uh, uh, nodes in the beginning, so I'll re read the first thousand nodes or whatever fits in the buffer, and then it gives you a buffer back, you work with a buffer, um, and while you do that, because all the input output is multi-threading, it will get more data uh, from the input parse, the PBF parse, the XML and all that, and give you a back buffer, uh, buffer by buffer. Um, so all the OSM objects that you work with in Osmium live in those buffers. That's a bit strange um, to get your head around in the beginning because they're not uh, instantiated like normal C++ objects are. But once they are instantiated, you can work with them uh, pretty much like normal C++ objects, except you can't change too much. So um, 
you've got a buffer here. Um, this sort of this thing is supposed to be the buffer, and uh, there will be a few nodes in the beginning, and then there will be the ways and, and all of that. And the buffer keeps track of how much memory is used. That is a pointer to the uh, committed in the end here, uh, and the capacity of the buffer. And buffers can grow automatically if uh, if if you want that. Um, and then each object, for instance, this way number one here. Um, it will have a header with a type and a length, so it knows when the next object is going to start, and then has some fixed object header with the ID, version timestamp, user ID, and, and all these things uh, that are always have the same length. And then after that, uh, there will be the nodes and um, and the tags uh, for array, for instance, or for a relation. Uh, there will be uh, uh, tags and members um, in in the buffer all in this one buffer. So you don't have pointers that point to different places and all the strings in other places. And this makes memory management easier and faster and makes it easier to, um, um, to, um, uh, to do the multi-threading because you don't have to keep track and lock each, each individual object, but only buffers that will be moved between different threads. Uh, so what falls from those buffers is objects can't change their size anymore. If I um, have an object and it has certain tags in it or something and I want to add a tag, there's no space after it because the next object starts. If you want to do these kind of things, you have to copy objects around. But this is something that most people don't do really that often. Um, uh, you can do some smaller changes if you change uh, the whatever the user ID that an object belongs to or something that cha doesn't change the size, so you could do those changes. Um, and you need special builder um, objects to build those OSM objects in the buffer. Um, and I'm not going to show any examples of that. Most people don't do that. Most people only read the OSM objects as they come from a file and then do something with it, so they never have to build the actual OSM objects. Um, so this was a decision by me saying, okay, this is a bit more complicated, but most people don't have to do that. Most people only read the data and it makes uh, things uh, more efficient this way. Um, yeah, less memory management overhead. Um, and uh, also those buffers can be written to disk or written to a socket. So it is very easy to read an OSM file and for instance, write part of it to disk as some kind of cache storage, whatever. And Osmium also has a ways of indexing those data so you can find back which object was in, in, which, uh, in which file in which uh, position. Here's another, another example of what Osmium, the command line tool, can do. Um, applying a change file, so you have the old uh, OSM file, there are two change files that should be applied to it, and then the result should be written out to the new um, uh, OSM file in this case. Um, uh, basically, this is the same as Osmosis can do or, um, or OSM update. Um, the difference here is that this also works with history files. So um, if you got in the old OSM PBF, got a full history, history um, the new one will also contain the history updated with the change files. Um, and that works because Osmium handles history a little bit different than what uh, uh, some other programs are doing, especially what Osmosis is doing. For Osmium, there is no difference between uh, an OSM object with or without history and an uh, OSM change object. The, the, those, those things that are in the OSC files, those, those change files, they all look the same in Osmium internally. Osmium keeps just track of that by using having a deleted flag, just like the original database has. And um, um, so most or well, many things will just work with Osmium with history files um, as long as you don't do um, uh, uh, some of the indexes or so it will not work. But if you just read uh, the data, it, it doesn't care whether those are um, history uh, files or not. Basically, the difference is only in a history file you have the same ID can show up several times with different versions. And if it's not, then you're guaranteed that the same ID will only show up once. Um, what you can also do, for instance, is extract from a history file uh, a specific uh, time. So in this case, uh, if you have a, a full history uh, planet dump, 
um, and you're interested in how the planet looked on the January 1st, 2008, um, with this command, you get a planet file that looks hopefully more or less the same as the planet file if you have downloaded that day. Um, we've seen the cut command already, and uh, now I'm not writing out to an OSM uh, a BZ2 file, but to an OSM OPL file, and OPL is um, the an, an, a new file format that I invented. It's called object per line, that's where the name comes from. And this is a bit how it looks, it's just an example here. Um, those, those lines that are wrapping, wrapping around here, they are supposed to be in one line. So all of this here will be one line, and then there's no empty line, and then will be the next line, will be the next object. So you have one object uh, in each line, and then you have the different parts. So you have the node uh, version, the deleted flag, uh, change set, uh, in this format, you can see how it looks. Um, it's, maybe this makes it a bit uh, easier to see. You always have this sort of signature, signal letter in the beginning that tells you what kind of type it is, but they always come in the same order. But this format uh, is very easy to use with tools like grep and arc and set and sort and all that from the command line. So for, you, for those of you who liked uh, to use those tools, um, it's very easy to do certain things. So, for instance, here, um, if I have uh, the Berlin OSM OPL for, um, file, uh, that's what I'm reading here, I'm grabbing for amenity equals postbox, so I get everything that's tagged amenity equals postbox. Of course, I would also get something, if somebody had a username amenity equals postbox, I would also get that, but um, um, you can write the grab in a uh, bit different way and then <laughs> You won't, won't get those. Um, I sort it uh, by the second column here numerically, so that's the version number, and then I get the last one that gives me the object that uh, that is uh, tagged postbox end uh, with the highest version number there is. And uh, in this case, you would get out this object. Again, I've wrapped the lines around. This would be one line that you get back. So you see this is node number, 8030881710106, uh, and it has 21 versions. Um, and this, just this one command line would, would find this for you, and uh, you get all the tags and, and all this other information. And if you have a history a dump, also in this OPL format, which you can also create with um, uh, Os uh, Osmium, of course, um, you could, uh, for instance, grab here uh, for this node ID, um, and uh, get the version number and the coordinates out there with, these, uh, with this cut command. And this would be the result. You see uh, all the versions um, and you see there's lots of versions missing here. That's because the redaction bot uh, was the 21st edit and it removed all of those. Um, and you can combine Osmium, of course, with lots of other great tools. Uh, the, um, uh, XAPI, uh, overpass XAPI, uh, for instance, if you can write the URL out, you can use it just as an as an input file. Osmium will detect that this is a URL and not a file name and will get this URL, pass it for you. In this case, you have to tell it that's it, that it's a OSM format because it doesn't know what comes back from the, um, uh, from the server. Um, and uh, write it out in OPL format directly, grab it through, through uh, this thing here, and this will find all the bridges uh, or everything tagged bridge equals yes in the bounding box uh, from the XAPI, and that then get a list of names um, of those bridges out and just write them to the output. Um, so this is just sort of one way of working with OpenStreetMap data without writing big programs. And it's nice for people who are familiar with those tools. And if you're not familiar with those tools, then this lo looks all very complicated. Um, any questions so far? No, it's all too complex. Either, either it's too easy or too complicated. We'll, yeah. 
tools that use that OVL format? No, at the moment nobody else uses that, um, and um, ah yeah, uh, sure. Um, Martin asked whether any other program uses this OPL format, and uh, no, nobody uh, uses it at the moment. This is just an invention by me, and um, um, I don't know whether that's that will ever be something that other people use. It has uh, has a few nice features, for instance, that uh, it's reasonably easy. Uh, to write by hand or understand, but it's still quite compact uh, compared to the XML. Uh, but I'm not saying that we should ever like publish uh, OSM data in, in OPL format. It is uh, geared for, for using it and working with it and not uh, as a download format, for instance. I'm not proposing that this should be a general uh, format that uh, other people should use or something. Um, and uh, yeah, one other thing I just uh, 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 remembered is at the moment I can only write this format, I can't read it. Uh, there is already code in different branch that um, parses that, but it's not integrated yet. Um, but at some point we'll, we'll have that. Um, we've already seen the C, a few C++ examples um, with the with the buffers, if you want to copy around bigger buffers, if you want to access the objects themselves, um, the next possibility is using those uh, uh, using iterators. So um, you can wrap basically the the reader that you initialize with the input file um, in this input iterator, and then you can loop um, just like you would in any kind of C++ loop. You can loop over those iterators and see each object that is in the file. Um, and um, you can also um, use this in any STL algorithm, and this is what makes this interesting. So for instance, this is another way of writing this copy. It's not as efficient as the other one, um, because it will copy every single object and not whole buffers, but it, it, uh, it would work. Um, so you can wrap the reader in those iterators, you can uh, wrap uh, iterate around the writer, and then just use the STL copy command to copy from, uh, from the input to the output. And of course you can use all the other STL algorithms. Uh, this makes it, for instance, relatively easy to write the change uh, apply uh, stuff because that's basically a sorting and write, reading things and writing them out in the right order. And that's just a few um, STL um, uh, unions and stuff in, in the end. Um, of course, this is still too complicated for many cases, so we have got this handler architecture um, where you can write handlers that um, you initialize once and then the data is fed into those handlers one after another. So the data is uh, read from the file, fed into the first handler, P, um, or the first object read from, from the input is fed in the first handler, the second handler and so on. Um, and then the next object is fed into all those handlers, and you can use some temporary storage uh, in those handlers in, in some cases if you want to. Um, so this is what you have to write. Um, you write this class, in this case my handler class, you derive it from um, the uh, Osmium handler, handler class, um, which basically gives you empty functions that you can then fill out. So you have got a node function, and every time there's a node in the input, um, you will, this function will be called with that node. And every time the way, there's a way in the input, this function, the way function will be called. And there's also callbacks for relations, and there'll be callbacks for areas uh, later on, and I'll, I'll have slides about that. Um, and um, so again, I'm, I'm, we'll show some examples how, how this works. Um, to initialize all of this, or sort of the, the, uh, the main program, uh, is again, you initialize the reader, you initialize your handler, and then you say osmium apply, um, which tells um, osmium to take the data, read the data from the reader, so the first argument here of the apply, that's where the data comes from, and then you get a, can add a list of handlers here, and uh, it will apply this data to all the handlers. Um, so um, as an example here, um, I want to compute the length of all the roads, there's a sum of the length of all the roads in an OSM file. 
Um, the code for that is on, on this GitHub um, link there. And um, this will be th three slides, and I've uh, uh, split it up into those three slides, but basically this is one program, and this does all you have to do. So if you copy this out, it should just compile and work. There's everything in there. Um, you need a few includes. Um, you include um, the handler because you're going to need this. And you include the have a seen um, function, uh, which you need to um, compute the length. And uh, Osmium provides those. And then you write this, this handler. So this is all basically, th that's the meat of your program. You tell it, um, initialize the length sum with zero. And then for every way uh, that's in the file, um, you find out if it's tagged as highway, then add to this length um, the length of this way, basically. That's, uh, that's what you have to write um, uh, to do the adding. Then it gets a bit complicated. If you, if you know an, an OSM file, you have the nodes in there, then you have the ways. Um, but the ways don't have the coordinates where they are. Um, so somebody has to take uh, the coordinates out of the nodes um, and add them to the way, so the ways know where they are. And um, that is the uh, node location for ways handler. Uh, that does it. So that's a handler like those other handlers I've, I've described before. It will, uh, for every node that comes by, it remembers, okay, this node with this ID is in this, that, this location. And then later on, when it sees a way, it'll look up for each node in the way. It looks up in its uh, storage where the nodes all are and puts this information in the way. And then the next handler gets a way that has uh, this information filled in and can then do, um, for instance, this distance calculation because it already has uh, this information. It's a bit difficult to set up uh, those, uh, the node location for ways handler because it's um, depending on, on your input, there are different ways of, of doing that and uh, they have different, uh, they need different amounts of RAM or different amount of disk space and so on. So it depends if you, if you have a, uh, a very small OSM file, uh, you, you uh, use a little bit of a, a different index than if you use a whole planet. And so there are some trade-offs, um, but basically is you look at the examples and copy one of those things out. And I'm st still trying to figure out how I can do this a bit simpler. So maybe, I c maybe somebody has an idea how I can do this uh, so you don't have to write that much boilerplate. Um, and uh, then you have to wrap all of this around, um, uh, put it in the main function. So um, I need uh, this first include line, any input, that means uh, uh, that the reader can read XML and PBF and all of that. If I, if I know that I'm never going to read XML files, but only PBF files, I can say uh, include Osmem IO PBF input, and I would only get the code for that, and everything else is not even included. Uh, we need the visitor, that's for the apply function, and I also stream here for uh, writing out the result in the end. So I initialize my reader again with, uh, in this case, the command line, first command line argument. Um, that's the file I'm reading from. I initialize here my uh, location handler. I initialize my road length handler that I've written myself and give everything to apply. Uh, apply will do its thing, and once it's finished, once the f it has read all the data and pushed it through the location handler and your handler, um, you can ask your handler for the length. Um, and in this case, I divide it by a thousand and then write out that. So that's the kilometers um, we have in uh, uh, road lengths uh, taken as highway. Of course, um, you could uh, change here in this case, this this just checks um, whether those are tagged as a highway, but you could make more complicated checks here or whatever. Um, so Osmium knows about geometries. As we have seen, it can add the node locations to the ways. That's something um, you will need in most of your programs. It can also assemble multi-polygons um, from the nodes and ways and 
uh, the members of the multipolygon relations, you've seen it can calculate line lengths, for instance. It can also convert geometries into different formats, WKT, WKB, and the OGR and GEOS formats. Basically, with those four, you, you have m most of the use cases um, uh, lined up. Uh, GeoJSON would probably be something uh, we'd need at some point. And I'm going to show you one of those uh, uh, cases where how you can can use it uh, on the on the node side. So there is this Node.js module that um, uh, uh, brings the Osmium functionality into Node. Uh, you just type npm install Osmium, and uh, Dane Springmeier has some has set up some fancy stuff there. That um, if you've got the right architecture on your computer and right uh, OS versions, all that, it will just download a binary and you don't even have to compile it yourself. And otherwise it will um, download uh, the stuff it needs and compiles it. And th so this is a very simple, small no, uh, JavaScript program that you can write. And uh, so first line pulls in uh, the Osmium library. Uh, then we set up the handler and again, uh, we need this location handler, it's called here in uh, JavaScript that does the uh, node uh, uh, location to way thing and your own empty handler um, in this case here. And then you say, I want to have for every way, I want to call this callback and it should write out to the console um, the uh, WKT um, uh, of the geometry of the, of the way. And then, oops, hold on. Um, and uh, then you initialize your reader with uh, the file name that you get from the command line and again call comp uh, apply um, and uh, and run this thing. So uh, it looks similar to how it looks in C++. There's a few changes here and there obviously, um, but this will give you the geometries of all the ways in your input file. Um, or going back to C++, um, a bit more complicated example, this one um, uh, is doing the multipolygon assembly. Um, uh, for the multipolygon, I need the, the a collector which finds all the different parts that are needed um, to assemble a multipoly multipolygon and then assembler in there somewhere. And, um, and um, I need again to read a file. I need to read the file twice because I first have to read it to get the, re the multipolygon relations and remembers them in memory. Um, this is what basically those uh, three lines do and um, uh, then uh, I can um, I can uh, I read the file a second time again need the location handler to uh, get the look um, coordinates from the nodes into the ways uh, and call my handlers in a in the right way and will assemble the multipolygons and then uh, call this my handler here um, call the area function here, uh, the area function on the my handler, just like it called the node or the way function on the handler. And in this case, I'm using OGR uh, to write out um, the uh, multipolygon that was created into a shapefile or a SQLite file or whatever, uh, into Postgres database or something. Um, I'm not going to go through all the details here if somebody has a question uh, about that. Yes? So in C++, a class is basically the same thing as a struct. And, um, and uh, the difference, the, the, the big difference is that a struct, all the parts are by default public. And in a class, all the parts are by default private. Um, so normally you would write, if you do it properly, you'd write a class and make only those things public that need to be public. But this, using a struct here instead of a class, saved me one line of writing public colon there on the slide. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, he asked uh, why, um, what that means is there's a struct um, that, um, um, that is derived from a public handler here. Yeah. So, yeah. As I said, it's a class, basically. Um, just if, uh, 
to go through this because uh, I asked around yesterday what you, what uh, people wanted to hear in this talk, and some people asked uh, to get uh, some information about yeah. So what do I have to do if I use the old Osmium and want to switch over to the new one? What changed? Um, so uh, first thing I mentioned that already, it's all C++11. Uh, it will not work with older compilers. You have to have at least uh, GCC 2.7.3, I think. Uh, 2.8 is better. Uh, and Clang 3.2 is probably OK. 3.3 is better. Um, there are many function signatures and other details that have changed here and there. The concepts are mostly the same, except this buffer thing, which is totally new. Um, and, and, and the multi-threading, but the multi-threading you normally don't see. Um, and um, But there are lots of small details. For instance, the namespaces are now all lowercase. They used to be uppercase. Um, and name changes, like, for instance, the position class is now called location. And um, so I have, with all the experience from the old Osmium, I change things he, uh, around here and there uh, to make it more consistent and all of that. Um, I mentioned all the OSM objects live in buffers. Uh, that um, if, if, you, if you only read the data, then this change won't affect you that much. But if you want to write your own objects in some way, um, uh, things get a bit more complicated. All this memory management will be through those buffers. There are indexes and, and maps that the old Osmium doesn't have. So I, I, um, there's code for, uh, for instance, uh, where you can set up easily uh, an index that gives you all um, uh, for every uh, way uh, uh, no, that you can, that you can find out which node is in which way or something like that. And, and there's uh, a code for that. Multithread, I mentioned that. A multi polygon assembly is done without GEOS. I, the new code, I do it all myself. There's no uh, external library needed for that anymore. And, and the OSMJS program that we had in the old Osmium is gone. And um, instead, I'm using, uh, I'm, uh, using a Node.js, and Osmium is just a Node.js module. Um, thanks to Geofabric, who found, um, paid for some of the early work of Osmium, and now Mapbox, who's paying for all the new um, development. So for the last year, I've been working for them, and they paid for all this uh, development uh, of an open source software, so that's great. And um, that's the end. Here's the, the website. There's not that much information there yet, but uh, the new Osmium live at, lives at this osmcode.org. Um, and uh, of course, all of that is in, in, in GitHub. Some of the examples uh, that I've shown are either in the lib Osmium or in the Osmium Contrib. Um, um, repositories so you can can see them there right um i've got another 20 minutes or so and uh, you can ask questions but uh, first thank you for listening and uh, not falling asleep and uh so are there are questions everybody has fallen asleep um, pretty much, Andy. On which platforms should the npm install Osmium? Well, it should work on on all Mac or uh, Linux things uh, normally, uh, but depending on what kind of architecture you have and all that, there will be a pre-compiled binary that will be downloaded, or if that doesn't work, it will compile and. Um, to compile, you probably have to install Osmium before that. So you have to install the lib Osmium so that it can be found when compiling. Um, yeah, um, he, he's, he's, he's looking into his screen, so he's trying it out um, while we speak. Um, <laughs> have, you, have, you, have you got it running or? Yeah, I haven't tested it yet. It did install without problems. It did install without problems. So. At least one person got it to run here. Thanks, Martin. So, any other questions? Yeah, Roland. Uh, Murray, a suggestion for the file format uh, about just do a magic detection. I think uh, I search for if there's the first non-white space character is a, 
is it less than, then I would expect it to be XML, and otherwise I expect it to be JSON if the first non white space character is in solid brace, and otherwise it's likely to be something binary. Yeah. Um, uh, so his suggestion was, yeah, his suggestion was to auto detect um, the file format from the content of the file. Um, uh, look, for instance, if there's a, a less than sign in the beginning, it's probably XML. And um, I've thought about that in. Uh, with the old osmium, I couldn't do that um, because I, uh, I would uh, give the input directly to a, a different library, XML library, for instance, and um, and that wouldn't work. But with, with the new osmium, this would actually work. And uh, yes, it's a good suggestion. I I'm, I should add that um, we, it would make a few things easier. Um, and I could also, if I use the HTTP, um, if I download. Uh, 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 using HTTP, of course, I could look at the headers and and get the information from there also. Any other questions? Uh, have you considered putting up versioning on that library so that users of the library can actually stick to a stable version or at least look up the change history to see what modification needs to be done to the old code? Um, yeah, question was, um, I've heard that a few times. Mm -hmm whether I considered uh, doing versioning, proper versioning, and yes, I've considered that, and yes, um, I will start soon with proper versioning. At the, so unt until now, I, I sort of considered Osmium to be a better or whatever quality, and um, I would just tell everybody, you have to go to GitHub and you have to get the newest version, otherwise I'm, I don't care whether it works for you or not. And, and, um, but yes, at some point, what now that sort of the software is used by more and more people and is growing up, it needs proper versioning and then of course later on also packages and all these things that come with it. Um, and yes, the new Osmium will have that. <laughs> Martin. The, the JavaScript interface, is it pretty much unchanged from the previous version? The JavaScript interface, is it unchanged from the previous version? Uh, now it has changed quite a bit. Um, the old one was very ad hoc, how you sort of, I thought it could look like, and the new one is a bit more like those things are usually done in the JavaScript world. I'm not a big JavaScript developer, so um, I need help there also from people who actually use that and to tell me how this is supposed to look. Um, and we're still sort of fiddling around with that, and there might be changes in the future there. I'm not sure, uh, especially with, um, at the moment, for instance, the JavaScript interface can't do the area stuff, the multi-polygon stuff is, is just not integrated yet, and I'm not sure exactly how this is gonna look. Um, it, the JavaScript, JavaScript thinks, or JavaScript people think in a very different way from how C++ people think. And uh, JavaScript has dynamic memory man management which the C++ side doesn't have and all that. And it's sometimes quite difficult to sort of integrate this and, and have something that looks reasonably similar between the different languages, but also uses the strengths of those languages. And um, uh, it, um, it looks different, but on the other hand, the differences are, n are not complicated in a way. I mean, you could go me mechanically through the programs probably and change everything around and uh, most of the changes should be uh, reasonably easy to do. Here's stuff. Okay, question was, uh, could I elaborate on what functionality I want to have in Osmium and what doesn't fit in Osmium or something or should be done in a, in a different place? So, um, basically, I think everything that um, is directly related to, to working with OpenStreetMap data in one form or another or that is useful for lots of people who work with OpenStreetMap data. So um, what I mean with that is reading file, files, for instance, in a specific OSM format, that's something that belongs in Osmium because there's no other library who, that, that will do that because it's specific to OpenStreetMap. Um, um, so it belongs in Osmium. Um, there are other things like, for instance, you saw the Havasin 
formula to um, calculate the distance um, and that is a pretty generic geometric thing that you could pull in from a different library and it doesn't have to be an osmium but it's something that lots of people want to have and is something that makes it easier be, uh, if you can directly work with ways and don't have to convert them into a geos format or something pull in a different library so i decided and it's not such a big thing so i decided to bring it in and, and of course it doesn't cost you anything if you don't use it you just don't include the setter file and, and it, it doesn't cost anything in your code um, so um, everything that has to do with basic osm data management that is sort of the area that Osmium is interested in. This is not about, it's not a rendering thing, for instance, it's not a routing library, or, or all those things don't belong in there, but just sort of the, the basic building blocks for working with OpenStreetMap data. And yes, this might be vague, and uh, I'll, I'll decide in each and every case. Uh, did, did, you have, uh, did you have some specific thing in mind? Spatial data, yeah, he's asking for spatial database stuff. Uh, for instance, maybe an R tree or something, so you can find um, OSM objects in a in a specific area or something like that. Um, I don't know. This could be something that might be interesting for lots of people. So maybe this is something we could add at some point. But um, I've no plans for that, and uh, um, so maybe that goes too far. I'm not sure. Yes. Did you do some, um, some conversion I mean, in terms of speed uh, conversion to osmosis? How fast is your program? Yeah, so he was asking about um, speed comparison, benchmarking, um, comparing to other software that use OS, um, OSM data. Um, I've done a little bit here and there. Um, so, um, and the answer is, as always, it depends. Um, unfortunately, I haven't yet, the, the multi-polygon code is quite um, quite new and I haven't benchmarked it yet against old multi-polygon code and that is going to be interesting. Um, uh, so, um, the, the uh, reading, reading files is quite fast because I use this uh, uh, multi-threading now and if you don't use multi-threading, uh, you can't compete with that at, at some point. Um, although uh, the um, OSM update, OSM filter program is also quite good because it takes some shortcuts, which I don't. And um, um, so um, compared to the old Osmium, um, it is a lot faster reading, writing um, OSM data. Um, and uh, it is, uh, yeah, it's, it's faster than os, uh, osmosis for some, uh, for some things. Um, that being said, there's still room for improvements. There's still uh, areas where the code needs more benchmarking and um, more, more, more um, um, profiling to figure out which parts we can make, uh, make, make faster. Um, osmium is generally quite good because it um, tries to use templating a lot. It doesn't use, uh, in, in many cases, doesn't use virtual uh, function calls and all that. So the code can be inlined and the code, uh, all the code that's not used uh, will hopefully just be removed by the compiler. Um, uh, so it is, I, I don't have any numbers to, to tell you, but um, uh, in many cases, it is uh, it is faster, although not hugely faster than um, uh, than things like osmosis or so. Uh, there was a question about uh, node coordinates from your example uh, with a row of lens. It's uh, work with handler and it's reads. Let 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 me find this. This slide here? Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, uh, maybe next slide where uh, it fill uh, locations for nodes. I wanted to ask, uh, where are those locations stored? Because uh, previously you mentioned that 
uh, each object uh, is uh, can be modified and uh, in Yes, yeah. Um, of way, there is only uh, identifiers of nodes yeah. and location should be stored. Yeah, so the question was, um, I said um, that I'm adding the node locations to the ways in those handlers, but earlier I'd, I had said um, that you can't change the objects anymore because they have a, once they have the length fixed, they can't be changed. And in this specific case, I leave space uh, enough space in the way that I can put the locations in there later on. Because this is something that needs to be done so often. Um, uh, this is a special case. I leave the space in there. So I store basically the node ID and afterwards there will be eight empty bytes uh, uh, for every node. And so I can put this information in there later. Good catch. <laughs> Um, you, you, you had sources one? Uh, no. No. After you have uh, answered this, everything, everything is all right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other question? Uh, have you been given any consideration to how easy it would be to write a Java? Wrapper? Have I given any consideration to how easy it would be to write a Java wrapper? Um, no, I haven't. If you uh, want to do things in Java, I would recommend use Osmosis, probably. Um, I don't know generally how easy it is to write Java wrappers for C++ code. Um, it's bad enough to do this, this for JavaScript. And... Um, but yeah, I, some people have asked about different languages like Python or so, and um, that's certainly things that can be done. But um, yeah, at the moment I'm only supporting the C++ side and the, uh, uh, the JavaScript side because Mapbox is interested in that. So um, uh, that's what I'm doing. But it, I, I'm open if, if, some po if some people want to do something else to help them uh, with uh, getting other wrappers going. Anybody else? Anything else I should show you or anything? I'll be around all day. So, um, Lucas, you look like you might have a question. Yes, uh, um, my question was when you do the storage for the coordinates for ways, yes. you have several options yes. to choose from. And uh, I was unsure uh, what to choose when I was using the Bosnia. Okay, um, so the question was, when I store the node uh, locations for the ways, there are several options, and um, uh, he was unsure which one to use. And so that is a bit difficult because there are several trade-offs uh, to make there. So um, I'll, as we have the time, I can I can go through um, through those. Um, if you have the whole planet. Um, the most space efficient way and actually quite the easiest way of storing all those node locations is basically have a big array and the index into the array is the ID of the node and in the array you store the location. Um, and um, the thing is for that you need about 20 gigs an hour or something um, to store all those locations for the whole planet file. If you if you have a smaller input file, you don't want to do this because most of your node locations will be empty. Um, because no, most of your nodes will not be in your input data. So you, uh, you choose a different um, way of storing that. Um, traditionally, the best or what I recommend with the old Osmium was the sparse table, which is a, basically a, a map um, or, a, or a hash um, that uh, Google developed um, that can very space efficiently uh, store data. So it's more space efficient than an STL uh, stood map or so. Um, and um, so you, you only need as much memory uh, as, as you need for the data itself. The, the overhead is quite low, but it's still for the whole planet, it would be too large. Um, so, um, so 
this is sort of one difference is, is the way uh, the things are stored. The other question is, do you have enough RAM or not? If you don't have enough RAM, you need to store to disk, which may, will make everything a lot slower, obviously. But if you can't, you can't do any, any uh, if you don't have a RAM, that's the, your only option. And um, then there's one other thing, which is a problem with Mac users. Mac users, the, the, the PSD kernel um, doesn't support the M remap call. And so they can't use, uh, can't use some of the um, some of the uh, options there. So ideally for the planet file, I recommend to use a big array, and that array is got, you get from anonymous shared memory, and will, uh, Osmium will grow it automatically. And this growing you can't do on the Mac because it doesn't have the kernel call to do that. It doesn't have the mremap call. Um, uh, in that case, you can use an un, uh, uh, shared memory backed by a file and then just delete the file and you don't, you're not interested in that file. Um, I don't recall exactly what the names of those handlers are, um, but I can look them up and, and, and tell you later. Um, so basically, sparse table is the one I would use for smaller files. Um, so up to uh, the whole of Germany or something is fine. But continent sized and planet file, I think it's called dense map something, dense map on map or something. I have to look it up. Um, and there's a lot more. And at some point, I need to do benchmarking with all of them to figure out for all the different sizes of planets and, and what are, which one is the best. And I've never, I've never done that uh, in a systematic way. Um, so it's still a bit problematic, that, uh, that area. Um, yeah. All the examples uh, that are on GitHub and all that, they all use sparse table, I think. So they work out of the box with smaller data sets. And, um, and when you have larger data sets at some point, um, you have to figure this out. There's also, I think there's an manual, there's, um, there's a little bit information about that. Should be. I remember writing something. There is a manual, it is on the, the source code is, is um, in the libosmio manual repository and it's linked from osmcode.org. Um, it is still very sparse, but there is some information in there and I'll, if I, when I have the time, I'll, I'll work on that and uh, uh, add more things there. So, any other last questions? Comments or anything? No, doesn't look that way. Okay, thanks for listening and I'll be around the whole day so um, you can come up and uh, uh, ask questions or whatever. Thank you. <laughs>